Hi everyone and welcome to this meeting hosted by Socialist Appeal. We've put on this meeting to try and process the events that have taken place over the last few days. Last Sunday on the 8th, we actually had a meeting on the origins of women's oppression. And this week, the reality of that oppression has been laid bare for everyone to see. We've witnessed an example of the most horrific and dark expression of the misogyny that runs deep throughout society in the case of Sarah Everard. And I think this has struck a chord with all women because we've seen our worst fears play out following her case, first as a missing woman, a missing woman, and then tragically confirmed to have died. But this evening, we want to talk more about how this case has helped shine a light on how systemic this problem is, because unfortunately, we know that this is something that happens all the time. Two women a week are killed by a current or former partner in England and Wales alone. And around the world, the statistic gets even higher. I think it's vital that we understand how and why this comes to be if we're going to be able to fight it. So I'm really pleased that this evening we're going to be hearing from um, two amazing speakers. We're hearing first from Natasha Sorrell, who is an NEU member, an activist and writer for Socialist Appeal. And then we're also going to hear from Karen Campos, who's from Izquierda Socialista, which is the Mexican section of the International Marxist Tendency, the IMT, which is heavily involved in campaigning on this issue of violence against women. So I'm going to hand over now to Natasha to introduce um, the start of this meeting. So, Natasha, when you're ready. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and thanks to everyone for coming along to this meeting. Um, we are, of course, here tonight discussing um, the fact that last week a young woman was walking home from a friend's house. Um, it was late at night. It was dark. But that's not something that's that typically unusual. It's something that you would think anybody can do. But tragically, on the 3rd of March, Sarah Everett disappeared on this walk. She was walking through a very highly populated, brightly lit area. Um, you know, it was well-walked paths that she was going along. And yet she was kidnapped and she was murdered. And she was murdered by a serving that police officer who has now, you know, since been uh, charged with her murder. And the situation is distressing, of course. But in addition, um, only three days before Sarah's disappearance, that same officer was accused of indecently exposing himself in public. Um, and, and despite that, when he was arrested on the 9th of March for Sarah's murder, he was still working his day-to-day -day job in the Met. And what I think this um, entire experience exposes is, is, first of all, the threat um, that women face in our society, but it also exposes that the police will always protect their own uh, before they're going to protect the public. And the response to this has been an absolute deluge of, of firstly anger, um, but also of women speaking out about their own experiences of, of fear, uh, violence and oppression. And I think it really you know, has um, kind of connected in a very meaningful way. We, we've seen a real outpouring, as I said. And this is because this fear um, that this could happen to any woman is present in all women. All women are, are very you know, aware of the fact that this could have been them. Um, and the fear and anger and, and just how fed up women are at this position in society, it's never really not been there. It's always bubbling away under the surface and, and women may talk about it from time to time. Um, but this instance has triggered an opportunity. It's created space, if you like, you know, for women to, to talk about this very publicly. And what it's doing is it's serving to expose how widespread um, this violence and this fear of violence really is amongst women. Just to give some examples of things that people have been sharing, you know, things that we take for granted that we do every day, sharing locations um, when people go for runs or for walks late in the evening, uh, texting to say that you're home or asking like, are you home safely? People carrying keys between their fingers. Um, and then of course, we've had the, the, the um, sharing of experiences of actual physical violence that women have experienced as well. And whilst it is true that the um, abduction of a woman off the street in this way is more rare, actually the wider picture that's being exposed here is, is very important. We've seen the same, you know, in the same week, the release of that report that showed 97% of women aged 18 to 24 had experienced sexual harassment. Um, in their lifetime, one in three women will experience domestic violence. And the number of women killed by a partner or an ex-partner um, has risen by over a third in the last year alone. 
And so Sarah's made really has, like I say, opened up this space for women to talk about these experiences, to talk about the things that they deal with every day, and, and really importantly, to generalise that experience. It's drawing together um, the experiences of women in solidarity, and it's exposing the extent, how widespread and how commonplace this problem is, bringing it back into the spotlight. And we've seen, you know, in responses, many vigils around the country, thousands of people have been involved in them. But most notably is the one that happened on Saturday that I want to focus on at Clapham Common, where hundreds, if not thousands of women um, joined to to have this vigil. But the the vigil wasn't just to, um, you know, it wasn't just a vigil. It wasn't just about mourning. It was actually also a protest um, against the daily violence and oppression and unsafe conditions that women are facing every single day under capitalism. Now, As we know, the official vigil was actually called off earlier in the day um, after the organisers said that the police force had failed to, you know, constructively engage and how that this could be held in a COVID safe way. But essentially what's happened here is um, the police had intimidated the vigil's organisers into cancelling the event, threatening them with the £10,000 fine for organising the the vigil itself um, under the pretense of this breaching COVID rules. Um, But nevertheless, people ignored it and they went anyway. Um, And what then ensued was absolutely disgusting mistreatment of the women at the protest by the police, manhandling of them, incredibly rough treatments, slamming them to the floor, trampling the flowers that had been um, laid down to commemorate Sarah. Now, the police's response to this was very rough, very manhandled, as I said. And in the process, they arrested, um, I think it's about four people uh, that's been reported. And they've stated that this was to protect people's safety. But there's such hypocrisy in their actions here. You know, we've been told for months now that it's okay to continue going to work in packed workplaces um, whilst buses have kept unnecessary places open. Workers have been travelling to their places of work on packed public transport. um, And, you know, teachers have been teaching classes of 30 pupils. All of this is COVID secure, apparently, but a socially distanced mask wearing vigil is not. And again, this is exposing those real interests of the police um, in, in their actions in this protest. Now, in contradiction, the protesters um, were holding signs that, that you know, showed they did not believe that this was a system, that the police were here to protect them, or that they had their interests at heart. We've seen the protest signs that read things like, killed by the system, we're told to protect us. Now, women know all too well that the police are not there to protect them. There's this institutional misogyny that exists within the police. Um, and because of that, we cannot trust them to protect women. And I wanted to just um, you know, take a moment to look at a few examples of the role that the police have played um, protecting women against sexual violence historically. One, uh, you know, I'm based in Sheffield, one quite close to here is the situation of, um, you know, the abuse, the systematic abuse faced by girls in Rotherham over a matter of decades that was brought to light in the 2000s. Um, And what became quite clear through that case was that women had, these young women had tried to report uh, what was happening to the police and their concerns had been entirely dismissed and this abuse went on for decades as a consequence. Um, the, The police dismissed them because they were working class, because they didn't think that they were trustworthy that they didn't want to bother with them um and that contempt that they have um for women and the working class i think is borne out in that in that example um but not believing um victims that their situation was made worse as a consequence of the actions of the police they were not protected in fact the opposite happened I think we can also point to the role that the police played um, in their infiltration of the environment movement, again in the 2000s, where they duped women into marrying them, essentially raping them, having children with them, destroying their whole lives for the advancement of the state over the environmental movement. This is an absolutely shocking, disgusting use of of this institution um, and that, that particularly had a negative impact upon women. And more recently, um, we can discuss the murders of Nicole Smallman um, and Bieber Henry. Again, uh, their murders demonstrate the contempt of the police towards women, in particular towards black women, with allegations having been made um, against the police involved in their arrest of them having taken selfies with um, with their bodies. And and this once again demonstrates this, not just a lack of care, but an utter disrespect and contempt from the police towards victims, towards women, and specifically towards black women. And actually, we should connect this struggle um, with the struggle against racism more broadly. You know, the role that the police play 
is not one of protecting the black community. When we know that stop and search is nine times higher um, uh, used against black people, we know that there is racial profiling using, used by the police. We know the horrendously aggressive treatment of black people who have been stopped and arrested that has been well documented throughout this year just alone. Um, the role of the police clearly is not to protect people in these instances. And so for both the women's movement and the fight against racism, more police is not the answer. And we know and must talk about the fact that actually the, arm, uh, the police are an arm of the state. They are not here to protect the working class, but to protect capital from the working class. And it's therefore no surprise, but nevertheless shocking for many to see, this horrific crime committed, first of all, you know, by the police officer and then the consequent actions of the police in the vigils that have been held since. And we see the class priorities of the police um, and of the state played out in this vigil that was held in London on Saturday evening. And actually, this, this, this point about class is very important because class priorities do come before everything else, despite the fact that Christina Dick is a woman. Um, you know, it was under her directions that this, the, the police carried out these brutal attacks on the protest. Um, and Bridget Patel, again, another woman, has also shown her priorities to the capitalist state in condemning the vigil um, and, the, and, and the actions she's taken since. And so it's not women in positions of power who are going to change things. They have that power. They're not doing anything with it. But more importantly, they're not able able to under capitalism. Um, we've also seen a response from, you know, the political parties that I think is worth mentioning. Um, you know, the response from the Labour Party has been to condemn what's happened, but that in, in doing so, they've called for more police. Um, they've also been opposing the recent police crime bill that would seek to restrict protests even further, but this was after the attack on Sarah, clearly showing a flip-flop that was only triggered after this tragic event happened. Um, and I, again, I think exposing that, that that's not really holding working people's interests and certainly not women's interests at heart there. Um, furthermore, we've seen calls today from the Tory party to have um, you know, an increased presence of plainclothes police officers in, in nightclubs. Um, but when it's the police um, who women, especially black women as well, should fear, um, this, this should come as no and does not come as any reassurance, um, but actually as a greater threat to people. It's definitely not the answer, but what is the answer? Well, as capitalism goes into crisis, actually it's working women who we're seeing suffer the most. Um, we've seen this demonstrated by a really sharp rise in unemployment in Britain and around the rest of the world, um, more precarious work for women and, and low paid, unstable work. We've seen a huge rise in domestic abuse and also in the domestic tasks carried out by women in the home as well. Furthermore, we've seen an attack on reproductive rights around the world, and decades of progress really is being is being snatched back um, and, and totally undone in a year. And those things cannot be redone very quickly because they were hard won in the first place. So clearly, the fight and the the kind of the reforms and the rights that we have won over the years that have been so hard fought for are not sol solid. They're not strong. Actually, they're quite fragile, and they're only able to last under capitalism whilst the economy is not in crisis. Now, the oppression that women face is not part of some kind of natural hierarchy. It's actually a product of class society. And capitalism, every single day, benefits from the exploitation and the oppression of women. For capitalism. Women play a really important role in the economy as cheap labour, have been able to do these um, you know, smaller part-time jobs that are less stable. Um, they provide domestic work and it can use women's bodies as a method of advertisement to sell things to increase profits. And, and it's from this systematic basis that all other symptoms of oppression arise um, against women from this, from this basis, this position that they hold in society. And therefore, the answer to solving this question is that we have to remove the material basis for women's oppression and the vile symptoms of violence and sexual violence that stem from it. And that requires the complete destruction of the capitalist system. We cannot have women free from oppression under capitalism. Capitalism is an unreformable system and we cannot make women safe within that. Um, the attacks and the clawing back of reforms that we've seen recently are really just the beginning as well. Um, you know, as, as the ruling class attempt to prop up this, this very rotten system that is capitalism, there will be more attacks on women's rights as there will be more attacks on workers' rights more, um, more generally, you know. 
And we now we know um, that under capitalism, women are trapped in relationships and family situations. They're trapped there because um, it's economically unviable for them to, to, to leave or to move out of those situations. And we also know that a lot of domestic violence, a, a very large majority um, I've seen in, in quite a few statistics now, is that a lot of that domestic violence is actually triggered by difficult financial situations. Both of these are massive causes of domestic violence or just violence generally against women um, that create an unsafe society for women to live in, but problems that do not need to exist because there are more than enough resources to properly, safely feed people, house them and clothe them. Um, but the trouble is, of course, we cannot access those resources whilst they are privately owned. So what happened um, with Sarah Everett is something that every woman lives in fear of. This is a characteristic of society for women. And it's not the first time that this has happened. And of course, tragically, it will not be the last time that this has happened. Obviously, women shouldn't have to live like this. And, and women have had enough. It's frankly appalling how widespread the violence against women is and their fear of that violence is within society. What is very clear in all of this, I think, is that the whole system is rotten and we, we need a revolution to bring down this really vile, degenerate system that's been shown very clearly, more clearly in the last year, I think, as well, to, to not care one bit for workers' health or, or for their lives. Instead, it's prioritised profit above absolutely everything else. So if we want to end the constant fear that women, women live in, and if we want to create a society that, that's free from oppression moving forward and free from the exploitation for women and for all workers, obviously, um, we have to fight to overthrow capitalism. We've got to educate ourselves in where this oppression arises from, in the origins of that oppression. Um, and that, of course, means studying the, and, and, ed and educating ourselves in the origins of class society. And this, by doing this, we can understand that how something arose, how it's developed, and how we are therefore we're going to get rid of it how are we going to remove this scourge from our society but we need to do more than just educate ourselves of course we need to organize because the capitalist state is highly organized it has multiple wings that are highly organized not least the police the government and the media we need to organize against that but what's really essential i think is that we cannot free women from oppression without fighting to end capitalism but significantly we can't end capitalism without fighting uh, for the freedom of women. These two fights are inherently twined, but in ending one, we can end the other. And that is the task that's before us. Thank you so much for that, um, Natasha. I think you really um, powerfully showed yeah, the link between women's liberation and the need to um, the need to end capitalism and the points you made about capitalism being a vile degenerate system as well of course that will distort the relationship that, that exists between men and women and so ultimately we're going to have to uproot the whole thing if we're going to have a chance at creating harmonious relationships that are based um well not based on the competition and the scarcity um and the and the yeah the problems that capitalism brings us so next, I'm going to introduce Karen, um, who, as I said earlier, is um, from Izquierda Socialista, the Mexican section of the IMT, and she's also part of the Women's Revolutionary League, who's going to talk about the situation um, in, in Mexico. So Karen, when you're ready. Thank you, Fiona. Um, well, I'm going to talk about uh, the violence against women in, in my country. Uh, that, and this is a really big problem for, for us. Uh, well, Mexico is a, uh, is a country that uh, has been uh, swept by a wave of, of violence. Uh, the news of uh, murders, disappearance, uh, shootings, etc., have uh, become uh, very common for us. Uh, this uh, daily news can't uh, surprise us anymore because uh, we have assumed this like, um, like our uh, daily reality. Uh, and well, uh, this uh, wave of, of violence has mainly uh, affected the most uh, vulnerable sectors of the population. Uh, and women are uh, facing uh, right now the consequences of another epidemic, uh, the epidemic of uh, violence and femicides. Uh, well, let's see some, uh, some figures. Uh, last year, uh, 967 femicide, femicides were uh, reviewed registered, um, also uh, 16,545 uh, rape uh, crimes uh, has uh, committed. Uh, six sexual crimes uh, are reported every day, every hour, sorry. 
Uh, and according to uh, the figures of the Executive uh, Secretariat of the National Public uh, Security System, on average, 10.3 uh, women are murdered daily. Uh, and less than 30% uh, of that uh, total are investigated as femicide and more than half remain unpunished. Uh, only uh, the 5% of the complaints of sexual assault are, or abuse end with a judicial convic conviction. And uh, also the numbers are, uh, are increasing because uh, not even the pandemic uh, has been able to stop the, uh, the femicide uh, wave and, and, and all the violence against women in, in, in Mexico. Uh, well, also these uh, figures make uh, Mexico the country with the highest rate of femicides in Latin America. Um, and uh, according to the United Nations data, at least six out of 10 Mexican women have uh, faced an, an incident of violence uh, at some time in, in their lives. Also, uh, four out of 10 uh, 18 year older women have uh, suffered some type of sexual violence. And in Mexico, the impunity rate of sexual crimes is uh, higher than uh, 90%. Well, in, in addition to the violence issue, uh, we have other evidence uh, of uh, women oppression, uh, which sentence them to uh, to a dependence and sum submission uh, situation. Mexico also has the uh, the largest wave, uh, wage uh, gap in Latin America, with a difference of sixteen percent, uh, which means that um, Mexican women must work uh, thirty five days more uh, during the year to equal a man's salary. Uh, added to this, uh, figures indicate that a uh, woman uh, dedicate up to uh, 42.8 uh, hours per month to domestic work. So uh, as we can see, uh, violence and inequality are a uh, part of the daily uh, reality of Mexican women. Uh, every day we go out to, uh, to the streets without uh, the certainty of uh, returning home alive. So uh, there are uh, plenty of reasons to, uh, to take the streets. Um, uh, and we have to take the street since uh, it is uh, this system and its a uh, bourgeois state who uh, originate uh, the, uh, the violence uh, through the extreme inequality and social uh, decomposition inherent to capitalism, which causes that uh, the, the Mexican state with uh, Lopez Obrador as president uh, has been uh, unable to offer a real solution to this uh, deep problem. At this point, it, uh, it has uh, only been able to offer a protest criminalization and allegations of infiltration of the movement to downplay the tremendous wave of violence against women uh, that, uh, that covers every corner uh, of this country. Well, also during uh, the pandemic, the conditions of, of women in Mexico have uh, worsened. Uh, due to the lockdown, violence has increased. During 2020, uh, more than uh, 260,000 calls related to violence against women uh, were made to uh, the emergency numbers, which represents an increase of uh, 60%. Uh, women are forced to stay with their aggressors uh, 24 hours, seven days uh, a week due to the economic depend dependence uh, on men. In addition, in addition to uh, to the violence, uh, host uh, work and a uh, child care have increased too. Uh, and also, uh, women are the second so who have been most affected uh, by the pandemic. Uh, according to uh, to figures from the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, between uh, April and August uh, 2020, 3.2 million women uh, lost their jobs. Uh, that represents a uh, sixty-four percent of women who had a formal job in Mexico. So uh, the gender gap in jobs uh, loss uh, due to the crisis uh, has been much uh, uh, greater in Mexico than in six other uh, Latin American nations, analyzed by the Inter-American uh, Development Bank. Um, well, this is an uh, unbearable situation which has uh, awakened a, a powerful women's uh, movement uh, in, in, in my country, in Mexico, which, um, which has uh, repeatedly uh, taken to the streets in massive protests against uh, violence and femicides. 
Uh, violence against a woman uh, has uh, permeated pr practically in all places, including uh, those that uh, are regarded as uh, safe spaces. Uh, femicides and rapes have uh, taken place within the premises of two of the most important universities in the country, such as a uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico and uh, the National uh, Polytechnic Institute. Well, um, with these uh, figures, uh, we can uh, see that uh, despite the, uh, the pandemic and the, and the lockdown, uh, the women's movement uh, hasn't stopped uh, because uh, our living conditions are uh, increasingly precarious and uh, we are no longer, any longer uh, wanting to remain uh, quiet at the oppression that we suffer daily. So uh, 2020 uh, was marked by uh, by great um, struggles of women. On, uh, for example, on March 8, on the International Working Women's Day, uh, official figures indicate that uh, 80,000 women attended the, uh, the demonstration, but uh, there were around uh, 250,000 women in the streets of Mexico City shouting the, uh, the slogan, uh, we want each other alive, free and without fear, not one less. Uh, and also a uh, similar um uh, uh, similar uh, demonstrations um take place in different states uh, um uh, in in Mexico uh so uh, all this movement is uh, displaying a great strength uh, well, uh, the, move, uh, the women's movement has uh, made some uh, achievements, such as the adoption of some uh, laws, such as um, Olympia law against uh, digital violence, which punish up to uh, six years in prison who spread sexual uh, content against women in internet platforms or social networks. Also, uh, the Ingrid uh, law. Uh, that uh, punish uh, with uh, penalties to, of three to six years in prison for uh, those who disseminate uh, images of victims of femicide. So these laws are uh, the result of the of the struggle and mobilization of, of women, and the name of the laws is in honor to uh, two uh, victims of these uh, crimes. So uh, these are uh, small steps, but uh, we know that uh, that laws uh, will not uh, solve the problem of violence, because it is uh, rooted in the in the social and economic basis of the capitalist capitalist system. But uh, they will help us to to show to the movement that it is not only laws that we need, uh, but a radical transformation of, of society. That's what uh, what we need. So uh, in this uh, last uh, period, it has uh, become clear uh, to us uh, that um, our places in the streets, organizing demonstrations for our basic uh, rights, organizing uh, ourselves in, in our workplaces for uh, better working uh, conditions and wage, um, to obtain quality uh, nurseries, uh, laundries, community kitchens that free us uh, from the domestic work, uh, fighting to generate security committees in our uh, neighborhoods that uh, allow us to travel safely, uh, creating a spaces where uh, where every uh, assaulted woman can take a shelter away from her aggressor, uh, and all uh, all of this uh, with the collective and democratic organization of our class. As a socialist uh, woman, uh, we call from Mexico to all women in the world to vindicate the class struggle, to use the ideas of Marxism as, as a struggle method, uh, to continue and fight back in, in conjunction with uh, all exploited sectors, because uh, regardless of our gender, race, uh, religion, sexual preference, we have more in common as a class. Uh, so uh, let's fight together for the emancipation of women. Let's fight together for the emancipation of the of the working class. Let's let's uh, move towards uh, to the destruction of the capitalist system, uh, and only uh, the socialist revolution led by the working class can eliminate forever all the material bases uh, that provoke violence against women. So um, from La Izquierda Socialista, the Mexican uh, section of the international Marxist tendency, we organize and fight uh, to combat this uh, system of injustice, inequality, and barbarism. Uh, so uh, we raise our, our voices, uh, demanding justice for all women who have been victims of femicide in Mexico. And we continue to demand justice for uh, Sara Abigail and Alexis, uh, colleagues uh, awfully close to our organization, who were uh, brutally 
in order. And now uh, we join with uh, with you demanding justice for uh, for Sarah Everard. So um, thank you for the invitation and, and receive all our, our support and solidarity from Mexico. So uh, for our comrades, let's fight against the capital violence. Ni una menos, not one less. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That was a really um, moving intervention. And I think you laid out really clearly for us that this is a global struggle, despite the huge number of, of femicides that are also taking place in Mexico. What's so inspiring is to hear about the protests that are taking place and about the fight back that is, that is happening. And it teaches us so much that we know that whether it's in the UK, whether it's in Poland or Argentina or Mexico, there is this global rebellion taking place, women um, all over the world. And in a lot of cases, men are coming out as well with this cause, the fight for women's liberation. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. So um, now we do have some time. We're going to give some space for uh, people to come in and, and contribute to this discussion. If you're watching on the live stream, I'd, you know, uh, you know, invite you to join us on the Zoom call. So if you would like to contribute to the discussion, then raise your virtual hand um, and I will I'll unmute you and bring you into the discussion. And then after we've had that, I'll, I'll allow uh, Natasha to come back and, and reply to us. Thank you.